Hi, good afternoon. Hi. Great to be here. And uh, I, I don't know how many of you know Kale, so I'm just going to take a couple seconds to tell you about our organization, just so you know uh, um, if you don't know us. And then uh, I'm going to talk about why focus on adults, first of all, like wh why are they important? Um, and then some of the strategies that we suggest need to be put in place if you're going to not only attract them, but graduate them. Because as you know, uh, it used to be that just access was important. But now, completion is what matters, trying to help people complete. So first, uh, quickly about Kale. We, we are um, a 501c3 nonprofit. We're a membership organization. I'm sure some of you are members of Kale. Um, we have uh, about six to 700 colleges and universities who are members. And we've been around for 44 years um, and with the same mission the entire time, which is to uh, actually advance uh, the agenda for adult learners and make sure that no adults are left behind in the higher education world. Um, and we also have uh, gotten known as a leader in the area of prior learning assessment, which was mentioned earlier this morning. I'm going to say a little bit more about that as an issue uh, shortly. Um, and then just trying to uh, become known in the world of employers for helping them remove obstacles to their workforce moving back to school. Um, and then uh, also we see ourselves as a quality assurance organization, making sure that programs and prior learning assessment and all the things that colleges do meet quality standards. And many institutions come to us when they want to get their programs reviewed for, uh, to, for their quality and rigor. But that's the goal, meaningful learning and credentials and work for every adult. Uh, and that has been the case for our entire history. Uh, now, why talk about adults? I, I always like to show this slide because it isn't the typical one that tells you how many adults there are with some college and no degree. It does tell you that. Uh, there are 45 in, 19, in 2016, the last year for which we have data, there were 45 million um, adults that fell into that category of some college. But then there's another 59 million who have no college at all. So altogether, we're talking about over 100 million people in our country who are not in school and could come back. And in that same year, that tiny little pie slice is the number of high school graduates, 9.6 million. And I've always found it odd that colleges, in the main, focus on the 9.6 million. They're all competing for that smallest slice of the pie for the traditional undergraduate. Now, many of you have adult schools or, or divisions, and you probably have some adult enrollment. Maybe some of you are wholly online and, and are appealing to adults. But what we see is that enrollment management departments Everything in the college is geared for the 9.6 million. Meanwhile, there are over 100 million people out there that we could be attracting back into our institutions. And so I do think that it is time for not only colleges, but public policymakers to pay attention to the 100 million and not just the 9.6 that graduated in 2016. Uh, and and, it, and this, this part of the pod, this has remained constant for a really long time, 10 times the number of adult learners. I just want you to think about that through the entire presentation. Because yes, it's hard to market to them. Yes, we have to learn new ways of doing things. But there's so many of them out there who need our help and could be coming back. Um, so that's the, the context for what I want to talk about today. And then I know you know this, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say these statistics to you anyway. Our position as a world leader in adult attainment has slipped continually. We've slipped in, by, by 2013 to 12th in the industrialized nations. Um, so we're, we're losing ground internationally. Meanwhile, 18 million job openings in the, next, in, in the current 10 years, ending in 2020, will require some post-secondary education. 
So it's, a, it's an enormous gap that we're seeing between the needs of our economy and our actual adult attainment rate. Um, and even now, just this year in 2018, we've already got 63% of jobs requiring some college or above. So we're already well on the way to needing post-secondary education for everybody. Now, that doesn't have to be a four-year degree. It can be a nano certificate. It can be an, a lengthy certificate. It can even be an associate's degree. But clearly, the need for post-secondary education is growing rapidly. The other thing that we have paid attention to and we've worked with, I'd say maybe 200 communities in the country so far, is to show the chambers of commerce, the mayors, the city groups, that raising the median adult four-year attainment rate, um, if you took the top 51 metropolitan areas in our country, the top 51, and if you just raised the attainment rate by 1%, and this is based on a lot of research, this would be, an, this would be associated with an increase of $143 billion for our economy because of the increased buying power of that 1%. Buying power, taxation, et cetera. It wouldn't take very much to make a huge difference in the national economy. So I really think colleges have a major role to play there. Now, we already heard from Karen this morning. That was just a terrific presentation. Um, we heard from her about who are our college students. And I just want to say a little bit more about the new, the new today's student, who they are. 38% um, are older and more racially diverse. Now, that's, that's not quite half, but it's, it's a, a significant 38% of undergraduates. And um, they are balancing multiple responsibilities. Three quarters of students are in some way working, earning, have, have other responsibilities. And they are, when they are part-time and working, they're twice as likely to drop out. So this means we've got to do a lot of additional things that are going to be supportive of these students. Um, they, have to, they have to overcome, I think, unique challenges. Uh, especially if they're first time, uh, first time college students in their families, and many times they are. They're parents, but they're also first time college students. We have to remember that the average student loan debt in our country is over $28,000. And for a person to take this on while they are already a parent um, or a family member is, is a serious problem. So we've got a student debt problem to manage. Um, and uh, only a third of first-time students actually successfully complete their degree. Think of what we could do if we could improve our services and our programs and our treatment of adult learners so that we move that needle on that one-third. Um, and, you know, I would just say uh, the failing to persist to degree completion is one of the biggest problems colleges face. Uh, it, it is it's a serious one, and it's particularly serious for adult learners. So, of course, you know the barriers they face. They face financial barriers and time constraints, and they face the fact that many of the programs are not accessible. That's why so many of you are investing in online programs, and I can't tell you how important those programs are. But even more, it's also they face perception barriers. Uh, I've had so many adult students that Kale has advised or counseled say to me, when I went to the website of X institution, I saw students you know, sitting on blankets on the grass. I saw young people you know, with, with you know, bright glowing faces thinking about their future. That's not me, I'm 45. I, I have a job, I, I can't sit on the grass, I can't I can't, I don't have that kind of time, you know. Um, it, w w why can't the website show people like me, you know? Um, and it would be, and they've said, I mean, something about sitting outside on the grass really gets to people. And 
And <laughs> I say, that looks so great, but I can't do that. I have to fit it in in between 50 other things that I'm doing. Please let the websites of colleges reflect the diversity of the student body. It's a simple thing, but it's huge. It makes a huge difference to people. Do you see yourself on the website or not? And that can turn people away. So, so I'm going to focus today on what your institution can do to better address the needs of the adult learner. So I, I want to um, do something that um, the Parthenon group uh, did that I thought was really a useful way to think about adults. They're not just this monolithic group. Uh, they, the, the, the college students that are our undergraduate student population, they argue, fall into six uh, major groups. Um, the first three are the ones that most colleges focus on, and they, are, they tend to be traditionally aged. So for the aspiring academics, I just want to say a few things about their profile. Um, they are generally 18 to 24. They usually have a great academic background. They often come from wealthier families. Um, they plan to go to graduate school. Uh, they, they care about the academic quality of the program. That's about a quarter of the student market, uh, according to the Parthenon Group study. Then there's the coming of age group. They're also 18 to 24, but they have no idea what they want to do. And to them, coming back means the social life, getting to know people, starting to explore subject areas and, and social clubs, and you know, they're just trying to find their way. And that group is about 11% of our undergraduate student body. And then the third group, the 18%, are career starters. And these students are the sort of practical, they may be younger, but they're very job oriented. They're also very price sensitive. It matters to them uh, how connected the job is, I mean, sorry, the college is to the job. How, how, how connected is the college to the local labor market? They value job placement, they value career services. So that, that, that part of the population the 24, the, the 11, the 18, this is mostly a younger student group. Now, the, the older, and, and, that, and these are the three personas I just talked about that most colleges target. But here's the, here are where most adult learners fall in the other three. Um, one of them is the career accelerator. And that person is the person who's really trying to come back because they know that if they get a degree, it will make a difference in their career advancement. And they look for, uh, again, college programs that will position them for the future. They're very practical and they're very time sensitive as far as they want to get this change made in their career quickly. And then there's the, the, the lighter green group, the industry switchers. These are often people that were unemployed. Maybe they've gotten reemployed in this economy, but, they, but they are, um, they're not sure what they need to learn, what skills and knowledge they need to learn in order to move from the career they're in to a, or they were in to a new one. And they too are extremely practical and they want experiences in college which will prepare them for this career transition of some sort. And then the last group they call the academic wanderers. <laughs> and these are the people who, um, they're really, they're often unemployed. They, they don't have any help in trying to figure out what they should be learning or what skills they need. And they're, they're in an institution, but they don't have a direction. And they're often the people that drop out. And uh, we have to, think about how are we going to make a special outreach to, those, that, to that part of the student body. So I, I don't know about you, but I found it interesting to think about our students being divided up into these different categories, rather than saying there's traditional students and there's adults. Uh, this tells you you've got different needs, different expectations. Now how are adult students different? And I, I want to spend a few minutes on um, 
h how we see that, like what, what Kale uh, has come to call uh, kind of an adult-oriented approach. Um, and we would say um, that you're shifting from a teaching model that's based on students depending on, on the instructor to a, a model where students are increasingly self-directed and where instructors and teachers are trying to help move people in that self-directed uh, mode. We also believe that, um, that in, a t in terms of a time perspective, very big immediate need for things to be applicable to the workplace. I'm not going to cover every one of them. I mean, you, uh, you can have my PowerPoint whenever Learning House sends it out. But just some things I want to highlight. Um, immediacy of application is really important. Whereas when you're a traditional student, you don't need to apply the things you learn quickly. Generally, you've got more time. And you tend to think about things as, well, I'll, I can do that in my senior year. Adults think about it now. How am I going to apply it now? The other, the other thing that we have argued strongly for is a problem-centered approach for adults rather than a subject matter-centered approach. Because we, our faculty in most of our institutions are subject matter experts. And they, they go deep into their subject matter, and then that's what they focus on. And what the students want to do is focus on, well, how does this apply to the world in which I live and work? And they want to focus on a problem, help solve it. Um, the other thing that you know <laughs> was already dealt with earlier today is the climate, the learning climate. I think this would be good for all students, but it's especially true for adults. Moving away from a sort of um, authority-oriented environment with the teacher in charge and the students in some subservient role to this more mutually respectful, collaborative, uh, community approach. And boy, adults really notice that difference in a classroom. If a faculty member shifts to this new approach, it makes an enormous difference, not just in their attitude, but in their completion rates. Um, and then, um, formulation of objectives. Not formulated just by the teacher, but formulated together. That is critical to students. Having a chance to have a say in what it is is going on in the classroom and what they're supposed to learn and how. Um, and then the activities. This is all following a theme. Instead of transmitting information, what students care about is experiential approaches. That's why there's an experiential word in Kale's title, adult and experiential learning because we know that that's what helps retain adults. If they are engaged in experiences that they learn from, that they can then reflect on and take action on, rather than transmitting in some sort of abstract way information. And then last, not just evaluation by the teacher, but evaluation by both parties. Evalu let me examine what I have learned and what I still need to learn. What's the new learning that I have to engage in? That should be something that's also that the adult is in charge of. So uh, one of the things that Kale uh, introduced about 20 years ago with the support of Lumina Foundation was a, a diagnosis that helps an institution look at how it is serving adult students and what the students think about it and then comparing their student reactions to the college's own assessment. And we just revised it, so we call it now the Adult Learner 360. But what it does is it also uncovers kind of what, your, what you think your strengths are as well on, on kind of 10 different principles that we have learned are really critical for adult student attraction, retention, and graduation. All three. And Lumina <laughs> wouldn't let us use the tool until we could prove that colleges that actually used this thing and made the changes necessary actually retained and graduated more adult students. So it took us a number of years to prove that. Um, and so what, what I, I think you might want to take a quick look at when you have a chance to look at our website is look at the 10 areas 
There's, there isn't time uh, today to go through all of them, but uh, I'll just highlight a couple things. So for example, in one of the principles is outreach. How do you conduct your outreach to your students? Do you overcome barriers in place and time and tradition to serve your students? And there are a number of metrics attached to that about how you measure your own success in doing outreach. Then there's the life and career planning principle. And it is one of the ones where colleges tend to not measure up to students own views of how it ought to be, um, addresses their life and career goals before, before or at the onset of enrollment, not waiting until the end. A lot of institutions are used to thinking about students coming into their career centers toward the end of their, of their studies. That what this is telling us is the adults want to do their life and career planning when they start or even before they start. And so that becomes a very critical indicator. And then all student support systems. This is an area of great dissatisfaction of most adult learners. Uh, the, you know, do, we, do we have comprehensive academic and student services online? Do we have easy ways for them to get the information? Are we open in, after five? Are we open ever on weekends? Do we take our services out to workplaces? Um, and then, of course, technology, which this group is especially uh, probably attuned to, the use of online approaches, and, and there are metrics around that. And then the others, um, financing, not surprising. Right? What kind of um, financial flexibility do you give students for payment? Do you have prepaid tuition agreements with employers so the student doesn't have to pay up front to enroll, but instead you can bill their employer and they will pay at the end. Uh, do, you, do you have, what other kinds of, of relevant and easy financing options do you provide students? And then of course prior learning assessment, and I will come back to that. That is probably the top most area of dissatisfaction of adults in, in most colleges. Um, and then we heard a lot this morning about the teaching and learning process. What are your faculty doing that follows some of the principles I just talked about that adults really need in, in a teaching learning environment? And we, we have introduced ways of measuring that and for you to measure yourself, yourself about that. The, then the, a, another big one of, that is not where it ought to be in most institutions is strategic partnerships. And that is not the same as saying, well, we have this training program and we offer it to X company, so we have a strategic partnership. What this really is, is a, do you have ongoing institutionalized relationships with employers, social service agencies, government, where students understand what you do for them and, you, and those employers and you have an embedded institutional relationship? And that is an area, I think, that needs considerable work on the part of a lot of colleges who tend to see their relationships with employers as transactional. And I think that is a short-sighted view, and employers would like to have more lasting uh, partnerships with people. Um, so the, the, there are a couple of others that I won't go into right now, but those are th there are 10 key areas, and we added adaptivity as the 10th principle when we redid this because we found that the environment facing colleges is changing so rapidly that if institutions don't have better and more f rapid decision making, they tend to really fall down in serving adult learners. So adaptivity, willingness to change, get, making sure your processes are more flexible and that you have mechanisms for decision making that are more rapid. So as I said, the areas, these, are, these tend to be two top areas of most dissatisfaction. So I wanna, I wanna just say to you that, you know, Kale advises probably mm, tw 25 to 30,000 adult learners a year. And how do we advise them? Well, we work for employers who have contracts with us 
and those contracts are for us to provide education and career advising to their workforce. So, for example, McDonald's. Um, McDonald's, we have a contract with them, and all of their restaurant employees have access to a program called Archways to Opportunity. And in it, you can go to school, you can do a lot of things, you can finish your high school diploma, you know, number of options. But to do all of that, you can see a Kale Career and Educational Advisor. And we help those people figure out where to go to school, uh, what their options are, how to use tuition assistance. Well, these adults ask us, you know, the questions that you can imagine. Do I have time to really get a degree? Will it take long? Will I ever finish? What if I can't afford to finish? What, what if the, my company's tuition reimbursement program isn't there or isn't enough? Um, how can I finish my degree more quickly? That's what they always want to know. What can I do about that? And then they say, I already know this material. Why am, do I have to take this course? Why do I have to spend an entire semester in a course that I already feel I know? And we hear that over and over again from students who come to our counselors. Um, so we really emphasize, and, and of course it's, it's a part of our history. I mean, it's what we've been doing. So we really have come to believe in it. Um, we believe that prior learning assessment is key to institutions, attraction and retention and completion. And I want to give you some, some survey data to back that up. But let's make sure we all know that we're talking about college level learning, not experience, but college level learning that comes from on the job training or military training or independent study that people do on the internet or on their own. Um, training courses or certifications that they take outside of college, uh, work experience itself, just, just um, you know, daily work experience or community experience, and the learning that's college level that happens to be in a non-credit course. And increasingly, we are seeing colleges starting to evaluate non-credit courses to figure out well, what within this course is college level. And what should we be granting in the way of credit for these courses? Now, if you don't have faculty involvement, it could be a, slope, a slippery slope. You can say, well, you know, why is it non-credit? Well, sometimes it's not non-credit because it isn't college level. Sometimes it's non-credit because it's easier to get them started. And that's what we find out when we dig in and work with institutions. Oh, well, this is over here in the non-credit division because we didn't have to put that through our curriculum committee we could just get it started and we could respond quickly to an industry need or something. Well, let's, let's think about what's in those non-credit courses and let's find ways to start reviewing those courses to see are there elements in there that are college credit worthy and help students grant, get the credit they deserve for the learning that is not in the credit side of the house. Now, here's the study. We did, now, by the way, we're redoing it this year because it's been, it's been um, eight years since we published it. But we studied 62,000 student records across 50 institutions, all types of institutions. Um, and we got a, an amazing result, which was that if a student engages in prior learning assessment, any kind, whether it's a test or a portfolio, or if they get their military credit reviewed, anything at all that they did, they were two and a half times more likely to graduate. Now this, this was an amazing finding, and it's, been, it's held up in other institutions looking at their own programs and looking at their own students. That, that perspective has held up, and it is also true in the program we manage, the prior learning assessment program that we started, which is called Learning Counts. And it's been in place about five years, and it's a, it's a service that we provide colleges who don't want to start up a whole big program on their own. Well, in, in our students, there are some 2,500 of them so far, we find the same thing, that if they're engaged in prior learning assessment, they are much more likely to finish. Uh, and, and that is a critical thing because they end up taking more credits at the institution. 
The other thing we found, and this is a busy slide, so you'll want to probably look at it when you, um, when you get a, a chance to look at it after, after the uh, uh, conference is over. We found that Latino students were eight times more likely to graduate if they went through some kind of prior learning assessment. So we sort of dug into that. We did a special study just on Latino adults. And we found out that the prior learning assessment process gave them the confidence to think that they could make it in college. It was the biggest factor in their completion. They suddenly had the confidence, I'm a college student. And sometimes, they, all they got in the way of PLA credit was maybe six credits of Spanish for Spanish that they already knew. But even if they got six credits, they were more likely to graduate, eight times more likely. And, and I, I do believe, because we did a follow-on study, that this is an accurate uh, picture for Latinos. So what it says to you is this issue of having confidence of, that I can be a college student, that my learning matters. That, that's a big deal. And, we need, and, and that goes to Karen's point from this morning about looking at the strengths of people and not their deficits. So when they get prior learning assessment credit, they feel that they have these strengths and that they can go on. So I, I believe that prior learning assessment has a tremendous effect on people's ability to graduate. And, and again, it can be any of these methods. It can be testing. It can be industry-recognized certificates that you recognize and bring into the program. It can become, uh, it can be evaluated non-college learning like um, uh, military training. That that we, in fact, we had a we had a um, a military guy that had been in the Navy who came into Learning Counts from one of our colleges that we were that we're managing the program for, and he, this guy had been on a huge battleship and had done a lot of industrial engineering type work. Well, he got 23, no, 24 credits of industrial engineering at a major institution working with us. So he almost finished an entire year of college from what he had learned, not through training, just on the job in the Navy. This guy was ecstatic. And the faculty who worked with him said, he absolutely has the knowledge of anybody that we would have put through this program ourselves. So when you can get a person like that, you, you don't want them to repeat what they already know, because that's a real demotivator. Um, so my question would be for your colleges, um, which of these options could you either expand or build on so that you help people save time and money toward their degree, and build confidence. That's what I should have put in the title, and build confidence. Transfer credit, we heard about that this morning. Um, can you do a better job with accepting credits from other institutions? I mean, I think we're, we're miserable at this in higher education. In, in general, we're just miserable. We, we make these students lose these credits and lose time. It is such a demotivator. So can't we do a better job? Can't we say something other than, well, the accounting course over here is not the same as my accounting course, so I, you know, I just can't give it credit. I mean, <laughs> I just think that we've got to get beyond those attitudes, or we're not going to be helping students to finish. Um, so military credit, training credit, which I've talked about, non-credit course credit, portfolios that people write about their learning. I mean, are you doing all of these? Are you doing them all well? Are you, do your students know about it? I mean, we, we went to a, a, a one college in Indiana that I won't mention who said, oh, yeah, yeah, we have a prior learning assessment program on our campus. And, and you know, we've had it for a few years. And then we said, well, how many students went through the program last year? And they said, two, you know, two people. We asked, well, you know, uh, how do you tell students about it? Well, we don't really. I mean, they, they learn about it from other people. I'm thinking to myself, you know, this is something that gives a person two and a half times more likely uh, chances to get a degree, and you don't even tell them about it. 
It's not on your website. It's not on the main site. Uh, it, w what are we missing here? There's really got to be a, a shift in our thinking. Uh, and and, and I, I really believe that uh, it, if we s take this seriously, we will make a huge dent in adult degree completion. We don't want that 40% not to be getting, a that, n that never will get a degree who started. What about all those some college no degree people? Millions of them. You know, let's do something about them. Um, so let's remember the standards as we do this. I just, we have 10 standards. We have a book called Assessing Learning, and in it are the 10 standards for doing really high quality prior learning assessment. That credit is for the learning, it's not for the experience. I'm sure you see these ads all the time. I was a cashier at Walmart for 20 years and I got X credits. Well, you know, we don't, we don't uh, believe that a person should get credit for what they did they should get credit for what they know. And helping a student translate from what I did to what I know is, is a key part of the portfolio assessment or prior learning process. There are ways to help students figure out what they know from what they did. And you've got to help make that transition. And then, you know, make sure that subject matter experts do the credit recommendations. Don't, don't have it done by someone else in, a, in an administrative role. Have Faculty experts make the evaluations. Then faculty control it, then they feel comfortable with it. And also, don't charge fees for the number of credits that you award to the student. Just charge the fees for the service you provided, regardless of the credits awarded. I can't tell you how many schools we have looked at that are still charging for the credits they award. That's too much of an incentive to give students too many credits. Let's, let's not do that. Let's just erase all possibility of a lack of quality and let's just charge students for the service of assessment, independent of how many credits they're awarded. I've seen students get more credit than they asked for, but they pay the same amount. And, and th so those are just three of the 10 standards. Just wanted to give you an idea about that. So um, as I said earlier, contrary to popular belief or the fears of faculty, they, student, they take more courses at their college if they undergo a process of prior learning assessment. Why do they take more courses? Because they stay longer. So they tend to take 9.9 .9 more course credits than students who don't go through prior learning assessment. So when, if, there's a, if there turns out to be you know, on your campus a kind of a, a, like an attitude about, well, if we do this, I'll give all these credits away and then we won't have them. You know, what you can really do is you can quote these statistics because they are based on very in-depth, careful research. Now, going back quickly to Learning Counts, the service we started, I, I just want you to know about it because it has been something that we, we've come to believe is a really needed thing. We weren't sure that it was needed, but uh, some major foundations invested in us to build it because they said a lot of smaller colleges aren't going to have the internal resources to actually scale up and do prior learning assessment the way it ought to be done. And they also won't have the money to train all their faculty to be assessors and experts. So they actually suggested to Kale that you're the quality assurance bearer here. You ought to have a service that colleges can take advantage of. So, you know, well, we decided to build it. <laughs> so five years ago we did, and the idea was make sure adults are aware of this, get college partners to work with us, much as Learning House works with you on online learning, and, uh, and then apply our standards to the process, have really solid rubrics, do a portfolio assessment service online, have faculty experts do the reviews, and send the credits back to the institution for their putting on their transcripts. So it's a pretty simple process. The students go through a course, they, they prepare their portfolios of their prior learning, they, they get them assessed online by faculty across the country or at your institution, and then, they, and then we you know, uh, award the credit or not and send it back to the college. So that was something that we um, did because we thought this would make a more accessible online approach, and it has turned out to be the case. 
um, especially if you use really solid faculty experts who have some training on how to do this. So there are these two approaches to building uh, your own prior learning assessment process. Either do it yourself internally or use a national online service like Learning Counts. Um, and both of them are valid and great ways of doing this. They just involve uh, different kinds of costs. Um, if you do it yourself, these are the things that I believe, sorry about that, that I believe you should um, consider. Think about getting your faculty really some, to get some high quality training so they know how to recognize college level learning when they see it. I just remember all the early days when I was in the SUNY system and uh, I was getting faculty trained on prior learning assessment and they'd say, well, I just, I don't see how I'm gonna know if the learning occurred if it didn't occur in my classroom. And we would say, okay, well, let's look at some student portfolios here. Let, just, let's just examine a few of them. And what did we find? They could recognize college level learning when they saw it. They could get agreement on college level learning when they saw it. And that's what all of Kale's research showed. So uh, I would say, get them trained. Get them a chance to see that if the learning outcomes of their courses are valid and easy to understand, students can develop challenge, uh, challenging of those learning outcomes in a whole variety of ways. This is possible, and it can be done well. Um, and then uh, the other uh, thing that we introduced, which, which colleges are telling us has really helped them, is the online PLA accelerator. And why did we introduce that? Because advisors were telling us they didn't have the knowledge to help students sort out their prior learning. So we thought, well, let's just put this online. Let's let students um, click on all their experiences and what they, where they might have gotten the learning, and then this will tell them. Might you qualify for a CLEP test? Maybe you qualify for a portfolio review? Oh, you have a certification from somewhere? Well, maybe you can get that reviewed by the faculty in the marketing department. You know, So uh, in the end, the person just clicks on it and takes this little survey, and then it goes to the advisor and the student, and they can pr proceed down the path. It just makes the job of the advisor a lot easier. So those were the kinds of things that we introduced. Um, and I'm not going to go into the details about the service itself. But the things that I thought you'd be interested in are for the 2,500 people that we've helped, the most popular subjects for the portfolio portion, not the testing, but the portfolio portion are these. And I bet you that you're not surprised to see them. Uh, business and management, information technology or systems, human resources, finance and accounting, criminal justice, um, things that might prepare a person to be a paralegal, hospitality and event management, project management is another one that's not mentioned here, and healthcare administration. These are, these are high uh, use areas within the Learning Counts Service. And we hear from institutions that these are high, high areas of prior learning assessment for adults as well. Um, now, uh, these, are, these are just stories of students that I'll skip over. If you do wanna see a video though, that highlights the benefits of prior learning assessment and gives you some examples of students, um, just go onto our website, kale.org slash get credit. And we often send students to that site so they can kind of begin to think, oh, you know, I might, I might have this learning. Maybe I can really get started somewhere at an institution. Um, so we want to be sure that you know that that is available. For, just go right to our website and grab the video. Um, so the other area that we don't have time for to go, to go into today is the area of career services. And uh, just because of, I want to allow plenty of time for questions, I'm not going to um, dig in on career services. But let me just say this. Um, there is an old model of career services that many of our institutions still have. And we've just done a study on career services among colleges, and we're coming out with a publication this summer. And it looks at kind of like what I'd call the old model. In fact, I might even have a slide on the old model. Let's see if we do. Yeah, okay, I do. Um, based on traditional students going full time, not surprising, they'll, they, they will take the initiative. It will be you know on the part of the student. It will be done just before graduation, and it's kind of at the margins. It's not central. 
But what we're seeing, and we've got, we, you'll see if you, if you grab the publication from our website, there are a number of new approaches that we're seeing, and we give names of institutions so that you can contact them. Um, kind of early proactive engagement with students, and then having career-related activities embedded right in the curriculum, throughout the curriculum. We're seeing much more of that, and we're seeing many more opportunities for experiential learning, even using people's work experiences to turn them into learning experiences so that the person can learn on the job in a new way, a job they already have, um, or get them into an internship in a new area if they have the time to do it. Um, and then pulling together career services, alumni services, and enrollment management, and having all three departments beginning to work together to be thinking about how to link more effectively with employers. We are seeing a lot more of that uh, among the colleges that we studied. Um, and not surprisingly, data and technology-driven tools are increasingly in use uh, among colleges and universities to help people with navigation, career exploration. Um, and people are more and more accustomed to using these tools. So we need to take advantage of them on our campuses. Um, and of course, advisors trained to serve adults. So Kale has uh, advisor training and all kinds of things that can help a college improve its career services. But just think about it. The two biggest areas of dissatisfaction, prior learning assessment, people don't even know it exists on campus, career services need addressing by every college that wants to better serve adults. The other eight principles also need addressing, but these rise to the top every single time. So I'd like, I just wanted you to know that those were the areas that I think need a lot of work. Um, now, we have uh, an international conference every November. I was talking to some folks from Malone College at lunch in Canton, and I said, hey, it's in Cleveland this year. <laughs> Try to get over to Cleveland. Um, there's a lot of uh, uh, workshops from colleges on how they've done things, what their innovations are um, in these areas, uh, what works, what hasn't worked, what are their challenges. So if you want to be in a, in a, you know, a learning mode, this, this would be a great event for you to um, attend, I think, um, especially from colleges that will lay it out and tell you what their challenges were, which, which often happens. Now the areas, the only two areas that um, I'd like to just end with are the, the more effective use of, of um, employer partnerships that I talked about earlier. We find that employers in general think it is difficult to work with colleges. In general. They, they, now that doesn't mean you don't have some great partnerships. Uh, but in general, colleges are viewed as hard to deal with, fragmented, slow decision making, uh, and not responsive. So we, we try very hard to try to rebuild those relationships between colleges and employers. And I, I, would, I hope that, that in your online work, you will think about partnerships with employers as being a critical part of your strategy. Building ongoing relationships to not just to get people into your online courses, but to get to understand what industry's needs really are. Um, and we, we manage some online coalitions between uh, colleges and employers. And where the employers really have input into the curriculum and into the design and the delivery they are such great partners, rather than being just a recipient of what you bring to them. Uh, and, and we can also see that when you work with them effectively, they will change their practices and policies if they just understand what those changes need to be. So I, I can't put enough emphasis on the importance of these strategic alliances with employers. Hard to do, very important to do. Um, and so I would just end by saying that, um, you know, we, we're very excited about the opportunity to, to um, continue to kind of plow new ground here for uh, the adult learner in higher education. And I think that the time for adult learners is kind of here, you know. Um, the economy needs them, 
the, the uh, communities now see the need, policy leaders are seeing the need. Um, and so if we can just be responsive as a higher education community, I really think that we can draw in some significant portion of this 100 million plus people that are out there who are waiting to return to institutions and get their credentials for the economy. Thank you. So we have a couple minutes. Yeah? She's giving me signals over here about how much time I have. We, we, well, we have a little time, right? We have a little time. So just be interested in your comments or questions. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, actually, uh, it's interesting that you ask that because that's starting to increase. We, uh, there used to be just maybe five or six institutions in the country that would do um, the assessment of prior learning at the graduate level. But now uh, I see a number of colleges, particularly at the master's level, uh, that are more, especially in the professional programs, are, assess are assessing the prior learning. And, uh, and, we've, and, in, and the reason I know that it's on the increase is that in Learning Counts, our own PLA program, we have more and more people asking for graduate credit. So I think that is a growing trend. Um, and would be happy to share those institutions with you. There's got to be more than one, or do you just need a break? Can't see the. Oh, there you are. I'm looking right into the light. I can't see you. Actually, um, w we wouldn't be able to tell you the cause, but we, but we do find that regardless of their prior um, life experience or their prior work experience, if they engaged in prior learning assessment of some sort while enrolled, then they, they do fit that two and a half times more likely to graduate. It's also true that whether or not they're getting financial aid they still are two and a half times more likely to graduate. So we control for some variables, not, not every variable. But uh, we do think it's the effect of the engagement in prior learning assessment. And recently, uh, a study that we did of our Learning Counts students, we're starting to think that the two assessment methods that maybe have the biggest effect on completion are portfolio assessment and uh, national examinations. Um, that, that if people pass uh, standardized exams at the national level or they, um, in, in exams made at the national level is what I should say, then they are more likely to graduate. The portfolio part we think has to do with reflection, the fact that they, in order to write a learning portfolio or produce something that is reviewed, they have to really reflect on what they know. And the fact that they did that then in, helps them engage in new learning in a better way. So we're starting to think that there are some methods that even do better than others. But overall, regardless of method, two and a half times more likely to get a, bachelor, a bachelor's degree is a pretty big finding. Um, you know, I, I, I think the number is decreasing because we've been so um, vocal about it. But I, I would say we're probably down to about 20% of schools charging for credits awarded. And we're trying to, we're trying to get that eliminated. Because it just, it just leads to 
people feeling that the process isn't a high quality process. You know, so, uh, but I, I don't know if uh, other colleges that would be at a Nakubo conference, if they would, um, if, if it is down to 20%. You know, we should actually survey that. Um, in, in the, we're, do, we're just about to mount a new survey, and I think we could add that question now that you asked it that way. Yeah, that would be a good idea to add that question. I'm going to file that away, take it back to our research team. That's a good idea. Any, any others back there that I can't see? I know we're almost at 1.30, but there's probably time for... Well, it, you know, it doesn't mean that, that there aren't some learning outcomes that are established for a course. It just means that how I get there and what my own process of learning might be to get there can be discussed and negotiated. It doesn't mean that I get to say, we're not going to cover half the material because I don't feel like it. You know, it means, it means that I get a chance to have input into the design, how, how I might go about learning what I need to learn. Uh, are there other things that I could substitute where there are areas that are negotiable? It just means there's more of a give and take in the process. It doesn't mean uh, you know, abandoning of the basic learning outcomes of a course. It, and by the way, speaking of learning outcomes of a course, uh, one of the things that we, we, we've been offering these workshops uh, to help faculty de determine learning outcomes for courses so that students have an easier time saying, I either know it or I don't know it. And it is amazing how many, we, we get courses from colleges all the time in our learning counts program. And it's so unclear what the learning outcomes are that it's really difficult for the student to be able to say whether they know it or they don't, you know, because it's just not clear. It, it usually says, you know, uh, we're going to cover in a list like six or seven subjects and there's no specificity about what I need to know. And so we, what we've come to believe is that about 50% of the time we are unclear about our own learning outcomes in our, in our own institutions. And so it makes uh, the process for students a lot more difficult. Um, so sharpening up our own learning outcomes I think is a major part of the solution as well. And need, needs work uh, among those of us in, in the higher ed world. Is that it? Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>